hello, hello. Welcome to the stream. This is Conlang with me, session number six. And I need to actually make sure that the stream description reflects that. There we go. It still said session five. <laughs> Bear with me as I'm still getting used to Twitch here. Thank you. Just making sure that's all set up. Yes, we're good. All right. All right, all right, all right. So, session six, I'm just going to make sure everything else that I need to have set up is set up. And then we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a moment. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So, welcome to section session six of Conlang with me. Today, we are going to um, talk about coordination and uh, order. And I imagine we'll also get through some of this morphology stuff that's here pretty quickly as well. Um, because a lot of it is just part one of that discussion and the actual deep, actual crafting of that stuff will come once we've talked a little bit more about sourcing the language. We may even get to sourcing the language soon. That depends on how quickly we go. So, um, to start, I was going to start with some review. So what we did last time in session five was we talked about syntax for a very long time. <laughs> we talked mostly about adjective clauses and noun clauses because we were thinking of leaving our um, noun constituent order pretty open, pretty loose. Um, so we were mostly working with a verb near the front, but the topic before the verb. Um, and that was sort of a, that sort of motivated a head initial uh, syntax generally, where it went, yeah, so let's say like clause goes topic, verb, everything else. And the topic can be any role. Um, I left a space here because I wasn't sure what was going to go here, but we might think about this today. Um, then we talked about nouns and the head noun, and then it's case marking, or if we have the case come before, we'll talk about that maybe today. Um, then we'll have a, any possessive, um, possessive pronouns, or maybe even possessive nouns here, and then an adjective. And adjectives in this language are basically going to be verbs. Um, so adjectives are really just relative clauses, relative adjective clauses. Um, and they might just consist of the adjective, or if it's a more complicated relative clause, then it might have a relative pronoun for anything other than the patient. 
if it's the patient, it's optional. And when I say it's the patient, the thing that you're describing with the, the head noun that you're using the relative clause to describe, if that noun is the patient of the relativized verb, then you don't need the pronoun. It's optional. It might help clear some ambiguity in some instances, but usually you're just going to not have it there. But if you're any other 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 case, so if it's the agent of the relative clause or I don't know, the recipient or something like that, some other case, um, the location, then it, there's going to be a relative pronoun there. Um, which just indicates, it helps to indicate that this clause actually describes the noun it goes back to. And our pronouns, um, our relative pronouns, are just going to be our third person pronoun. So it will agree with the head noun. So it still tells you, we're still talking about the same thing. Um, so if it's like a phenomenon noun, then you're going to have a phenomenon pronoun that shows that this relative clause then goes back to the noun. Um, and we talked a lot about how that was going to work. Um, noun clauses got a little bit hairier. And um, I kept saying last time, because it was a very long session and it was a very long day in general, that there was probably some very obvious solution to some of the problems I was having with the noun, um, noun clauses that I wasn't thinking of. Because the thing is, these noun clauses could also just be verbs. So you could have an entire verb phrase that is functioning as an argument of the main verb. So you have your matrix verb, your main verb, and then you have a subordinate clause to that verb that is basically acting like a noun. Um, so some of the examples we had here were like, um, I study science in order to learn, or just to learn. To learn, or in order to learn, that sort of clause, to learn, is the purpose of study. So it has a role in relation to study. So you, what we talked about was marking verbs for case. So if you have a noun clause that is a verb, the verb will indicate that it's a noun clause by marking itself for case, unless it is the patient of the verb, um, which I don't think we had any examples of that, did we? No, we did. Yeah, we did. Um, with want and need. Um, we had um, the patientive of want. If we want pizza, then the patient is pizza, and the experiencer is I. And then here, with want to go, to go is the patient of want, um, or it's in the patientive case, so you don't mark it. And in that case, it's typically going to just come after the verb. It could come before the verb, if you want to topicalize it. Like, what we might do in English, we might say like, to go to the beach is what I want, or going to the beach is what I want. And then in that case, you would just take the clause and put it before want. Um, so the only thing that was really an issue is where we were using a noun clause where there was basically the equivalent of a pronoun. <laughs> Um, that we were basically dropping. <laughs> so here, uh, for example, I will take you to where I sleep. What we're dropping is the place where I sleep to that place where I sleep. Um, so there's actually like a, a noun. And we were talking about how if you have a relative pronoun, you'd have to double mark it. You'd have to mark it for, well, you wouldn't have to. It would just be ambiguous to not. Um, and it feels kind of clunky, but it also feels clunky to double mark. And so we'd have to make a decision. Does the relative pronoun mark the role of the clause that it is introducing? Um, in this case, it would be sleep would be the, uh, or where I sleep, the where is the location. Or no, it's the, here it's the, the goal of take. It's where you're taking someone to. So where could mark the goal of take, um, but then also where is the location of sleep, where I sleep. Um, and so we were talking about how do you mark, do you have two pronouns? Some languages do that, where they'll have two pronouns. Um, uh, some might choose what it is in the relative clause, some might choose what it is in the matrix clause. Um, so we could make that choice, or we talked about the 
um, probably impractical in this language, option of double marking it for both cases somehow. It would probably be doable, but we'd have to think of a lot of different ways to do the combinations of the cases, and I don't particularly feel like doing that in this language. Um, but um, the sort of obvious solution to both of these, um, like for example, this is where I sleep. Um, we kind of have the same issue where um, sleep is a verb. <laughs> And we don't exactly have a copula in this language. So like the pronoun that's missing could be the copula. But um, one of the goals, uh, if we go back to overview, one of the goals, sorry, there's like a little pop up there for an example that I was thinking about. Um, one of the goals is detailed information is compact in this language. And just none of those um, solutions felt compact. And what I didn't think of, the very sort of obvious solution to this, is that expressing these ideas in this way, in this like kind of trying to transport the um, sort of European -y syntax into this language, um, is not compact. And it would be more compact to just rephrase it. <laughs> um, just not really do this kind of thing where you allow this, because you would say, I will take you to the room where I sleep. That would actually solve it. Room would be marked for, um, uh, would be marked dative as the goal of take. And then you'd have a relative pronoun showing that where I sleep describes the room. And so then you're fine. You have the relative pronoun mark the location. And I was thinking, oh, well, that's less compact, but... It would be even more compact to say, I will take you to my room. <laughs> uh, like, if there's a word for bedroom, I will take you to my bedroom is a lot more compact than I will take you to where I sleep. Now, there could be situations where I need to do this kind of a thing, um, but there's it would be really difficult to come up with a, with a situation where I cannot rephrase it in a more compact way. Um, similarly here, this room is where I sleep. You can just say, I sleep in this room, and make this room, which would be the location there, make this room the topic. Um, because the kind of situation where I need to do this thing, like this is, this, the, this room is where I sleep, or let me take you to where I sleep, really drawing it out like that is giving it more emphasis and topicalizing it with, um, by like giving it more explanation than is really necessary because I'm trying to give more detail. In this language, I can use saliency. I could just make it more topicalized by moving to the beginning. So I could say, I sleep in this room, but this room, the in this room part will come first. So like, in this room, I sleep. And it kind of has a similar effect to this room is where I sleep, just with the more compact syntax I'm going for. Um, similarly, I could just say, my room, I will take you, right? And then my room would be the data, so it would be my room, I will take you there. So that was kind of the, I kept saying, there's probably something really simple that I'm forgetting with this that I wasn't thinking about, and it was that. It was that what I was trying to do was already not really com compact and kind of a wordy. I was stuck trying to make a wordy co construction, not wordy. <laughs> um, and instead, I'm just going to avoid the construction because I have ways to get around it with um, my syntax. Um, so that was the solution there that I wanted to go over. And um, I think that's the only thing I really wanted to review. The only other things were sort of the ideas before of merging cases or mer merging classes. I thought about that, and we will get to that when we get to the declension. So we can mark off the review. Um, Actually, one last thing I do want to review um, is just going over the goals again. Um, so uh, we have our goals of humanities and social sciences is sort of like what I am engineering this language to be um, built to express easily um, or in a compact way. That was sort of the chief goal. Um, and sort of as a subset of that, having it be um, done in a compact way 
And then finally, I want to like it. <laughs> I want it to be aesthetically pleasing because I want to actually use this language. Because I said, I've kind of fallen into a rut where I'm not actually like being motivated to continue to use my conlangs because um, I just kind of get demotivated from making it because I'm like, I, am I actually going to use this for the goal I intended? Um, so I want to actually use this language, and so having it be aesthetically pleasing is an important thing, but it, the problem is recently I've just been making languages that I find aesthetically pleasing, um, but I'm very fickle with that, so I'll be really into an idea, I'll work with it for a while, and then I'll get bored of it, then I will stop using the language. So I'm having the goals come first, like other more concrete goals, or at least they are still kind of relative, but... Um, more sort of like having something to work towards more easily than this sort of more abstract goal. I mean, detailed information is compact is also very relative, and I'll talk more about that today probably, but um, it's still something I can like actionably put into place, whereas aesthetically pleasing, it's just, it's just going to change <laughs> over time what I find aesthetically pleasing. Um, but I'll still try to strive to make something that I generally like. So, those were the goals, just as a reminder. So, the next thing on the agenda is to work on coordination. And I honestly, I've thought about this a lot. I did some review of some stuff and coordination. And I feel that I have a very clear idea of what I want to do with the main coordination in this language. And so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about like different options that are available to me. Um, I'm just going to go very basic with this, and if more complex coordination issues come back later, I will touch on them, but I just want to kind of at least touch on this briefly because I have some ideas. So with coordination, um, the key things to talk about are, so all the stuff with the adjective clauses and the noun clauses, these are all sort of subordination issues. We have sort of Clauses within clauses. There's some more uh, subordination issues to talk about that we'll get to in the next item after coordination. But this is going to be the majority of my coordination, or my subordination, sorry, is my different like subordinated clauses, uh, whether they be describing things as adjectives or standing in the place of roles um, as nouns. Um, so what I want to talk about with coordination, I want to make sure that these like thicker rows are dragged down a bit, just so I have space. Um, and I'm still doing this on syntax because it's still syntax related, um, and we're lagging a bit. Apologies. Oh yeah, we're really lagging. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, there we go. No, no. Hello, chat. I'm just struggling with uh, Google Sheets here. It's kind of lagging on me a bit. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to talk about coordination. We talked about subordination last time. So coordination, they're kind of three basic types of coordination that I want to talk about, and those are conjunctive, um, whoa, yeah, sorry, things are lagging. I did clear the cache before today, but, um, yeah, we've got conjunctive, um, um, and I coordination, that's good. Um, yeah, no. So, uh, coordination, I'll explain what it is once I get these down. So, we've got uh, conjunctive coordination, we've got disjunctive coordination. Um, I'll put a space actually so that we can give some examples. Um, disjunctive and I do not know why Google Sheets is going so slow. Um, adversative. So, um, what coordination is, in, in contrast to subordination, 
which is all the stuff we dealt with up here last week with um, relative clauses and noun clauses. Yeah, I, I'm going to try to clear the cache again right now. Really, really, really glad. Um, I also think I have another program running in the background that's taking some up some bandwidth. So I'm going to make sure that that's closed as well. I forgot to do that before the stream. Um, with co uh, subordination, we had clauses within clauses. So uh, like a relative clause describing a noun as if it were an adjective. And all adjectives in this language are actually going to be um, subordinate clauses. They're all going to be relativized verbs. So to say that someone is pink, we're going to say that they are being pink. Oh, sorry for that noise there. Wow. Um, I am just in the process of attempting to close background programs as I'm talking. Um, because there appear to be a lot of things running in my background that are slowing my computer down right now. So, um... All, all of the adjectives in this language are going to be basically verbs. Like, to say that something is pink, you're going to say that it is being pink. Um, it is pinking. Um, uh, so if we have like the blue, the blue door, it is the door which blues. Um, and it's clear from the syntax that it is not doing the bluing because it's not the agent, it's the patient, um, that that is how that is going to work. Um, so that um, is an example of subordination. The other subordinations are the ones we see here. Um, with the noun clauses, so like the, uh, with like, I want to, let's see here. Let me scroll down. With like, I want to go to the beach. To go to the beach is a clause, and it is within the bigger clause of I want X. So I want, just like we had, I want pizza. Instead of pizza, we have a whole other clause, to go to the beach. Um, and we talked about how this language is going to do that. We're going to have the verb go, and if it is something other than the patient, it's going to be marked. But here, it's just the patient. Um, with coordination, what we have are, instead of things within things, right, um, clauses within clauses, what we have instead are um, things that are on the same level, but you have multiple of them. Same syntactic level. So rather than um, sort of enveloping each other, what coordination does is it kind of puts things alongside each other. So in English, we have lots of different conjunctions um, that coordinate. We call them coordinating conjunctions. Um, and conjunctive coordinating conjunctions basically express the idea which uh, we have several different words in English which do this, but the key one to think about here is and. So with and, we are joining two things and we're treating them the same. They are, um, they're just sharing whatever syntactic space they have with each other. So if you have, um, I don't know, a car and a boat, these are both, you know, in English, these are both nouns, and you're just listing them. And in a sentence, you could have a sentence like, um, uh, I gave her a car and a boat. Just two very extravagant gifts. Um, in this language, what we could do is we can say, <laughs> So if I am the topic, I doesn't have to be the topic, but let's say I is the topic, uh, we can, probably the topic is car and boat, and those, they would go first, but we'll, we'll pretend that I is the topic. So we're saying, I gave her the car and the boat. What did you give her? I don't know. Um, that could be our context. Um, try to one-up me with my gifts. So um, I'm going to have the first person be the, um, be the giver here. So they're going to be the agent the one who gave. And then our verb is give, and it's in the past, and it is a single event, so it would be perfective, so we wouldn't mark it. Um, that's just sort of our default case in the past uh, for now. I'm actually going to talk about that again later, potentially. Um, and then the givey, um, which we use the data for, we use the giving case, she's the sort of goal 
of the gift, then we would put her and she would be a third person. Um, and she would be a uh, human um, and dative. Um, we don't have to put it in this order. It, it, of course, everything after the verb can come in whatever order we want it to. So she could come last if we wanted to do that. Um, but I'm putting her here just because it goes that order in English, and so it'll be maybe easier to see the comparison. Um, so we have the third person dative, and then we have a car and a boat. And both the car and the boat are the patient. They are the thing that we're getting. They're technically called the theme when we're talking about ditransitives, but in this language, we are training them the same. So that means we're not marking them for any case. So we're just going to have car and boat. Now, how do we coordinate these? This is the question. How in this language do I want to coordinate these? So there are a few different options for how we can coordinate these. We can do it with a syndeton, which is basically your, you don't mark it at all. You just have a word and then another word. <laughs> car, boat. Um, this happens sometimes even in English when we give long lists. Um, where we'll list multiple things and we might not have an and until the very end of the list. Um, so we could say, um, you know, if you're shopping for groceries, you might say like, I need carrots, tomatoes, celery, blah, 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 blah. And, and then you say your last item on the list. Um, a full asyndeton in English though isn't usually considered a syndeton unless there is no and whatsoever. So you just give a list and it's clear from context that there's supposed to be an imaginary and between all of them. Um, and so this happens in poetry and in literary writing a lot of the time. We don't do it a ton in our speech, though. Um, we do a syndeton with some of our disjunctives a little bit more often in speech, uh, but we are not there yet. So um, this idea of using just a syndeton for... Um, lists was my initial idea before we talked about all the subordination stuff last week. But now that we have our syntax working the way that it is, I would rather actually not do that. <laughs> um, and I think I'll explain why when we get to order and ambiguity a little bit better. But um, there is some ambiguity when we just have our nouns next to our nouns with no coordination. Um, it's not necessarily clear that one isn't describing the other, and that's an, a syntactic ambiguity. Now, if things are different cases, that's a little bit more okay. For example, with this being dative and a pronoun especially, I'm going to assume that it's separate from whatever these are, because these are in a different case. They're just the unmarked patient one. So um, that's okay. But car and boat, um, I'm not even sure how I'm going to do compounds if I'm going to do that in this language. And so I just want to be safe and have a way to coordinate these. So I could just have a word. So I can do it syndetically by having a word and here. Like a word that means and. I'm going to write it with an ampersand for now. Um, so I could just have a word that means and. Um, and that's what I like to do a lot in languages. Now the thing is a lot of languages have different ands, and I've done this before, different ands for different levels of the clause. So what I've coordinated here are two nouns in the same role as each other. Um, so they're both patients of the same verb. So they're and. There's there. I gave her a car and a boat. So kind of what I'm aligning there is I gave her a car and I also gave her a boat. So there I used also as well as in sort of emphasizing the conjunctive. So what I'm doing is I'm saying the verb acts the same to both of them. And in the second sentence, I actually re repeated the verb. I gave her a car and I gave her a boat. And what the and did there is it coordinated not the two um, patients. It coordinated two whole sentences or two whole clauses, I guess. I gave her a car and I gave her a boat. And that and coordinates give and give. Or in this case, it's past gave and gave. Um, I gave her one thing and I gave her another. So gave and gave are being coordinated. So um, some languages will use a different and when you have two verbs that being coordinated, depending on the order. Um, so there are some different pros and cons of doing that. <laughs> um, and I will kind of explain some different examples where that can happen. So if I have, let's say I do two verbs to the same object. So I could say like, um, 
I saw her and I said hello. Okay. Now here we have first person singular dative of C because you're the recipient of the vision C and we have the same like three human um, and, but here she's the patient she's what you saw and we can have an and right and then we could have another topic the topic being I but since the topic is the same and we've made it the topic I um, then the thing that would make the most sense to do is actually drop the um, drop the topic here because it's the same topic and just say and and then just say said hello and we do that in English too because I is the subject in both of these sentences now I is not the dative in both of these sentences in the second one I is an agent because when you see someone we've marked that as dative because you're the recipient of the vision you're the experiencer so you're not an agent you're not doing anything to her by seeing her um, Whereas saying hello, you are actively doing that. So you are an agent. You're doing something with your mouth. <laughs> um, so say, and then hello, whatever the word hello is in our language, it is going to just be the thing you said. So it is um, going to be patient. We don't need to mark it for anything. What we might want to mark is that it's a quote, like it is what is said. We'll talk about quotatives and stuff later. Um, but this and here, is just connecting two sentences with two different rolled topics. But you could also have a situation where you could say like, I um, prepared and actually I could, actually let's do this one. I needed and folded the dough. <laughs> um, so here, you kneaded the dough and you folded the dough. So what's happening here is that the dough, the patient dough, is being shared by these two verbs. So we have I and then the, I is the agent of both of these. So we're just going to be agentive and we're going to say need. And then we could say and <laughs> need. <laughs> we did have need up here, yeah. Needed the dog. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, need with N-E-E-D. That's fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I need... Need would also be accurate. I do need some dough as well. Um, <laughs> that's fun. Um, well, if we had need here, it would actually do some interesting... <laughs> <laughs> it would do some interesting things to the syntax, yeah. Um, need and fold uh, dough. And dough is the patient here pretty clearly. It's being done to, there's stuff is happening to the dough here. So what what's happening here is that these both of these verbs are, they have the same patient. <laughs> I made you dough, but I needed it. That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> no, no, no criticism there. That's a perfect, um, perfectly constructed sentence. The syntax is impeccable. All right. Um, now the thing with the problem with this is this is actually technically syntactically ambiguous. Not so much with need because need is tends to be a transitive verb. We tend to need uh, an object of need. <laughs> uh, we tend to need an object of k-need. Um, so it's not as ambiguous. But if this were two different verbs, like maybe I, let's say I, I, mm, let's think of an ambitransitive verb. I think that's where it's the most problematic. So I, um, I, maybe I burned, 
There's one. That's an early tip verb. I burned and folded the, the dough. <laughs> if we had that sentence, there is technically an ambiguity. Um, and there are plenty of other situations that aren't, don't involve dough where this could be an issue. Um, I burned and folded the dough is ambiguous um, because of the ambitransitivity of burn. Uh, you can, it could mean I burnt the dough and I folded the dough. I did both things to the dough. But burn could also mean I burned, like I started to heat up myself and also unrelatedly folded the dough. Um, and the and between these things is ambiguous a bit. And there are plenty of other ambitransitive verbs. I just can't really think of any that would apply to dough personally, but there, there are there are a lot of situations where this could be a syntactic ambiguity. And what you would need to do is specify that dough is, in this situation, if it's the, the latter case where I am catching on fire and also unrelatedly folding the dough, there would be a way to distinguish that in the one case, both verbs are being done to the dough, and in the other case, they are not. So you're not sharing um, patience. Instead, you are having on two unrelated sentences. And one they, way that that could be done is to repeat the subject. So I could say, I burned and I folded the dough. Um, this could still have the same ambiguity, but I could just decide that in this language, if you repeat the um, thing with the same rule, uh, you are separating them more definitively. Another way would just to be to not allow this kind of coordination. If they're separate, you know, you might want to do something else. Like we might use also to do this in English to like show that it's conjunctive but not sharing the same object. We might separate them out. I burned, I also folded the dough. Like also, I could even have an and there in English, but in this language I might not. I could separate it out by maybe putting the coordination somewhere else. So I could still have like them connected, but move the and somewhere. Or one thing I do, I, I could do, is have the and come after both things. So if they're together, right, if I both burned and folded the dough, and if I both kneaded and folded the dough, the and could come after. I could say, like, I burned, folded, and the dough. If it's both, and then if it's not both, if it's actually separate, I separate them with the coordination. Um, so that's an option. Um, I'm not sure how much I like that, though. Um... One thing I would be okay with is if I actually, go, it wouldn't always work, but it would cut down on the number of cases where it's ambiguous. I'm actually generally fine with this kind of ambiguity. I don't have much of a problem with it. I just did want to mention that it is technically there. Um, but there's another kind of ambiguity with um, coordinators, and it comes more into play with disjunctives, but it does come into play with conjunctives too. And English has some interesting ways of like getting it across. Um, and that is the sort of relative inclusivity of the coordination. So let me get into disjunctives to kind of maybe explain this a bit better, and then I'll come back and talk about how it applies to and as well. Um, so, yeah, so disjunctives. In English, we tend to get this idea across with or and nor if it's negative, like or, what or is presenting are alternatives to what is put before. So, you know, you could say, um, um, for example, um, I'm trying to think of an example of something. If the chat has an example of using or, that would be great. But if not, I'm going to try to think of something. Um, so, let's see here. Um, oh, you use it to row a boat. Oh, yeah, like an or. Yeah, wrong or, but thank you. <laughs> I might use that sentence somewhere else, actually. You use it to row a boat. Um, actually, that would be a good thing to test our way of doing noun clauses on. I'm actually going to write this example sentence up here. You use
use it to row a boat. Um, this is going to be useful. I just want to test this with our noun clauses when we get back into just the order and ambiguity stuff. So, disjunctive, or, and norm. So, let's say, um, uh, um, do you want pizza or a hot dog? <laughs> okay and have that be a question. We'll come back to how I do questions later, but um, for now, let's talk about pizza. Um, okay, so we're gonna say want, you want, and the want-er is going to be the dative because they're experiencing a need, or not a need, a desire. So want, and then we have two patients. We have pizza, and then we have hot dog. I'm gonna make hot dog one word just so that I, the spaces are clear. So, do you want pizza or a hot dog? So both pizza and hot dogs are patients of what? They're what you want. And so the question is, how do I mark these? And if I'm going to have just a regular and, which I suspect I will, and I'm not going to really differentiate it between, you know, what parts of speech I'm conjoining, um, I might as well also have that for or. But or has an interesting issue with inclusivity. So there's actually two kinds of ors. There's um, what are called inclusive or and exclusive or. So this is different than cl inclusivity with pronouns like inclusive versus exclusive. But um, what it means basically is an inclusive or means that you could have both <laughs> uh, of the options. Or if you have more than two, like this or this or this. Um, inclusive means that you could have any of them. Actually, I think it makes more sense to start with exclusive or. Exclusive or means you can, you have to choose one. <laughs> so, do you want pizza or a hot dog? If it's an exclusive or, that means you have to choose one. <laughs> like, they're mutually exclusive. Um, so, um, If someone asks you, do you want pizza or a hot dog, and they were using an exclusive or, that means they need you to choose between one or the other. Like, they're about to make a turn, and one way is the way to the pizza, pizza shop, and the other way is the way to the hot dog stand. And they need you to choose, and they only have enough money for one option. So you need to choose. You can't, you can't do both. Whereas if it's inclusive, do you want pizza or a hot dog? Um, and I kind of did an intonation there, thing there. I said, do you want pizza or a hot dog? That kind of invites the possibility of both <laughs> a little bit in English. It's not clear. There isn't really a super clear way to do this in English. But um, what it does is it says that you have you, you could have both, potentially. Um, so that is inclusive. One way that we can um, do this a little bit in English is using like either or, and then also having like, but not both <laughs> at the end. We have to kind of clarify it in English. Um, I tend to also be okay with this being ambiguous in different languages. It could get confusing at times, especially because I'm going to be talking about social science, so it might be worth it to have two different ors. Um, pizza or a hot dog, but not both, versus pizza or a hot dog or both. Um, So, um, if I had an inclusive and exclusive or, one thing I was thinking about is, like, kind of doing a similar thing with and that would clear this whole kneading and folding sort of thing, where it's, like, if with the burn example, I burn and folded, fold the dough. I'll make it present just for the example. I burn and fold the dough. Um, if it's, say, quote-unquote inclusive and, it means that the dough is included in both, <laughs> and if it's exclusive, the dough is only included in the clause that it's set in. Um, the fold the dough. You're fold. You're bu you're burning up, and then you're folding the dough. Now, the thing in this language is, it wouldn't be ambiguous because I would have a different role in relation to burn than it would with fold. So, in I burn and fold the dough, if if I'm doing both, then I'm the agent of both. So it'd be just like this sentence. It would have the same syntax. 
um, it would be, you know, I'd be the agent. But if I burn, like, if I'm on fire and folding the dough, I would be the patient of fire. Like, I would be the patient of burn. Because I'm not, unless I'm burning myself actively, um, which, if that were the case, I'd probably have a reflexive marker or something on burn to clarify that anyway. Um, but in either case, because I'm not the agent of fold, I would need to indicate that I'm the agent of fold by having the pronoun. So the pronoun would clarify that they're two different actions that I have different roles in. Um, so that would already be clear, and maybe I don't need an inclusive and exclusive, and I don't mind having the ambiguity of an inclusive and exclusive or. But another issue that comes up with both disjunctives and conjunctives is exhaustiveness of the coordination. And what I mean, and English has a very nice way of doing this, um, and um, a lot of Indo-European languages have a very, like, even maybe more um, elegant way of doing it than even English does. <laughs> but um, uh, exhaustiveness is like, so for example, I gave her a car and a boat. Um, I'm kind of implying a period at the end of that. Like, I gave her a car and a boat. Those were my two gifts that I gave her. But I could have a, like, a um, situation where I say, I gave her a car and a boat. Um, but there could be more things that I gave her, right? Uh, here, I needed and folded the dough. I could have also done other things, right? I could keep the list going. And one way that I can cut off the list, make it definitively like, these are the only things I did. English can use both and, both dot 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 and, to like kind of clarify that a bit. So like, I both needed and folded the dough. And... That could mean two things, like the both and can have two different functions in different contexts. In some, it's just emphasizing the fact that you did the two of them. Um, maybe you're emphasizing that it was you who did it, and maybe you're like, I both did this and this, and maybe you should start pulling your weight and helping me with these, I don't know, whatever you're baking. Um, so it could have that kind of rhetorical um, function. But it could also just be saying that those are the two things you did. Like, I both needed and folded the dough. That was my task list. I got those both done, and now I'm finished it's your turn to get involved or i could say i got i gave her both a car and a boat um but nothing else <laughs> like those that's it um both and is can be pretty ambiguous in english but if i were to do that in this language something like that i think it would be more definitively like this is how i can tell that the the list is over um in Japanese, there are different words for and, depending on if the list is exhaustive or not. Um, I think it's, you use, oh, I can't, I think I have it backwards. I don't remember which one is which, but there are two. There's like to and ya as, um, as particles, and one of them indicates, why am I not remembering this? Jeez. Um, one of them indicates that that's it in the list. Um, I think it's to that's the exhaustive one, and ya is the non-exhaustive one. So I think it's, if you have to, if you use to for the list, that means that's the entirety of the list. And if you use ya, that means there could be more. If I have that backwards, forgive me, <laughs> future people watching this. It's been a while since I studied Japanese. <laughs> but yes, so there is that distinction. And they just use different ands to get that across. What, um, one thing that earlier forms of English would do, um, and it, they, it had a similar ambiguity to both and where it could have multiple functions. But one thing it could do is that you could um, repeat the word and <laughs> and do it both before and between. So to say, I gave her both a car and a boat, like that's it, that's the entire list. I could, I would say like, I gave her and a car <laughs> and a boat. So you repeat the conjunction before. So it kind of brackets it. Um, I could have that. I could do something like that. Um, uh, in Old English, you wouldn't really do it as much with and. You would usually use ye. I could say, like, ye, a car, and. Or I could say ye, ye. But sometimes ye, ye would also mean or. So it could get a little bit ambiguous there. Um, um, but that's something I could do. Another thing I could do is actually do the opposite. And if it's, if it's, if it's the entire list, I would just have the normal and. And if it's not exhaustive, like, there could be more, I actually say and again after. Like, I gave her a car and a boat and 
and then end my sentence there, and the and indicates that it could keep going. Um, I could do that. It kind of just depends on which one I want to consider as like the default one. I could also just allow both and allow you to choose which one you want to emphasize. Like you want to emphasize that it's going on or you want to emphasize that it's before and otherwise it's ambiguous. I rather like that. Um, and I can do a similar thing with or. In English we do, we have instead of both and, we have like either or. Like either this or that. Um, and it's kind of, it, it's kind of the end of the list. Like there's only two options as opposed to there being more. Um, and then if it's negative, you can have neither this nor that similar thing. Um, and in um, Romance languages, typically it's just or, or, like you say o, o in um, Italian, for example. Um, or you, if it's neither nor, you can say ni, this, ni, that, blah, 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 uh, for neither nor. So again, kind of like Old English did with and, um, and you can use, in Old English, you can use ye for this. You can say ye one, ye other. <laughs> yes, the O O does look kind of like an emoji there. <laughs> um, uh, I I'm okay with doing that and having it be similarly optional. Like I could do a conjoint. Uh, the thing you're conjoining with the con uh, a, a coordinator is called a conjoint or a conjoin. Um, so I could say C for conjoin, um, and then coordinator and conjoin is like ambiguous. I could say and C and C is sort of exhaustive. And then I could say C and C and is non-exhaustive. And I could have it work that way for the disjunctives as well. Adversative is just but. <laughs> which works similarly. There are some different things with but. It could be but or uh, with clauses. Sometimes it's but or it's however if you're coordinating different clauses with each other. Um, or uh, nevertheless is another one. Um, lots of lots of different adversatives, but they kind of all share s um, the same function of kind of sh giving an exception to what was said before. So you could have it in a list like um, you could say like, um, oh gosh, I'm coming up with a bad example, or a no good example, I mean, every example in my head is just not working very well. Um, I could say, um, Sorry, I'm not good at giving examples. I had pizza. I, let's see, I ate pizza, or no, let's say the pizza. The pizza and the mozzarella sticks. I needed you a pizza, but I ate it. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, let's actually translate that sentence <laughs> when we're done figuring this out. Or not translate, but figure out what the syntax of that sentence would be in this language. That would be fun. And I also wanted to say you use it to roll about because I want to check that when we get to word or an ambiguity. So I ate the mozzarella sticks. Um, I ate the pizza and the mozzarella sticks, but not the... the pizza crust because I am someone who doesn't eat crusts. Um, this person, I'm going to eat their crust because I will, I love crust. <laughs> but if this person is saying that, then I'm going to eat their crust. So, um, so we're going to have, I is the agent of all of this. So I, um, agent, and then eat because it's a past event. So it's just going to be unmarked. Uh, and then all these things are the patient. So we have pizza, we have mozzarella sticks. I'm gonna just say mozz sticks as one word, just to save space. But, and then we have a negated thing. Not 
crust. I'm not going to say pizza crust, just to save space so it doesn't go on to the next line. Um, so here, the but is kind of like ending the coordination by giving an adversary to it. So it's like, I did all these things, but I didn't do it to this one. So similarly, you're kind of saying that the verb was done to these things, but you're saying it wasn't done to this. You're kind of saying this is like an anti-patient. It's the thing that was not eaten. Um, so you're giving exception to the verb. Um, so that is what's happening there. And um, you don't tend to have the similar, like the same kind of thing we have with and and or, where you have like an exhaustive list versus a non-exhaustive. That doesn't really come up as much. Um, but what can happen is that you have like sort of something that applies to everyone except for someone. So you could say, I ate all but the crust. And that says kind of the same thing that this sentence says. Um, but in English, we don't need the not there. Um, we just say all but, I ate all but the crust. And what the but does is it says that you didn't eat the crust. Um, and that's why it's called an adversative, because it does, it's kind of, you're saying it did the opposite of the role. Or like it put that noun that you're putting but before in the opposite of the role it would have. Um, similarly with a verb. So I ate pizza, but... I, let's see, but I didn't, um, let's see, but I didn't make it. I ate the pizza, but I didn't make it. Someone else did. So what but I didn't make it is doing is it's giving sort of a, maybe a contradiction to what came before. Like maybe there was an expectation that you did make the pizza you ate. And so saying, but I didn't make it is maybe what that's doing is it's saying like contrary to your assumption uh, like if this were an and you'd assume i did both but because i didn't i'm gonna say but instead um so it kind of has this negative <laughs> but i ate it. <laughs> but i hated it it is the opposite of that but i didn't make it yeah um it kind of has this negative um, bent to it. That is what the adversative has. So, um, what I tend to, I just tend not to do anything particularly interesting with adversatives. I tend to just have a word that you could usually translate as but or however. And, um, what happens is it tends to have sort of, it tends to, um, in my conlangs that I make, it tends to include the sort of not in there. And it kind of translates closer to more like except for. Something like that. Like except for. So I ate pizza and moth sticks. And then you say like something that could translate to but or except for. It kind of just means both. And then you never need the negation because the adversative kind of implies the negation anyway. Uh, so we have a negative sort of thing with nevertheless. So like despite the precedent, nevertheless, here's the sort of adversative to that. Um, so I think I'm fine just not doing anything very spicy <laughs> with uh, coordination and just kind of keeping it what intuitively makes sense to me, because that's kind of important with my goal anyway, is I want to be able to intuitively use these. So whatever applies to the and ampersand here, ampersand is also going to stand for whatever or is, and then um, but will just work the way except for slash but tends to use in my languages. Um, and I'll just be fine with that. And I'll clean up this stuff and make it less messy later. So I'm going to cross this off my agenda now, the coordination. There are other sort of issues that come up with coordination. There's gapping and stuff like that. I am not particularly worried about that right now. If it comes up later when we're like actually using the language once it's being put into words and stuff, um, then we'll talk about that. And there's also not that much with order and ambiguity I still need to discuss, really. Um, but I'm going to just, basically what I wanted to do is kind of test how my decisions are going to play out when I'm using the language. So the first one I wanted to look at is you use it to row a boat. Thank you, chat, for giving me this one. So, you use it to row a boat. So, the verb is use. And...
I'm not sure that I need a word that specifically means to use um, in the traditional sense because of the way my instrumental case works. It might still be useful because I will be talking about tools sometimes. So let's just pretend I have it actually. Um, I might not use it in the way that it's used here in English, but um, let's just say for the sake of argument that I will have a word that roughly translates use in this language. So the agent of use would be you, so it would be second person, singulative, agent, you're the, you're the user. So then we have use, and it's going to be non-pass, but we'll talk about why I'm not going to mark it like that in a minute. Um, so um, you use it to row a boat. So you use it. Let's say it is Oh yeah, an oar. So yeah, I'm going to say that it refers back to an oar, which is a tool, which is one of the case, they're the, the noun classes we have here. So it's going to be a third person tool. And I kind of changed the way that I'm glossing tool. I'm just calling it craft. Anything that is made by humans, like crafted by them. So this could be like processed foods, or it could be tools. Um, anything that's crafted. It could be clothing. It could be a conlang. Those would all be craft. Um, that would be their gender, is craft, craft gender. Um, we'll talk about what I did with the genders in a bit. Uh, we used to have 10, I think we have eight or nine now, um, and I'll go over the choices I made when we get to the declension. Um, okay, so um, craft is, so that refers back to the boat. This is translating it here. It, some third person thing that is crafted. Sorry, this this little pop-up, maybe it was not a good, a good idea to put this here. Um, I had something I wanted to do with it, but I'll do that. That's going to come later. I just forgot that I was going to need rows here for today. So I'll put that way down there. Okay. The amount of lag that Twitch is going... Or, um, not Twitch. It's uh, Google Sheets is going through right now is really... It's a lot. Okay. So... We are here in the, whoa, no. <laughs> this is what I mean when I say it's lagging. It's just over scrolling. Um, okay. I'm trying to get it back to where it was. Okay. So my sentence is kind of lost in this word soup now, so I'm going to bold it. Um, I had these bolded for a reason, but we won't really come back to that today, so I will unbold those for now. Um, so we've got you use it so far. And then to row a boat, so this is a noun clause. To row a boat, rowing a boat is the purpose of using. Um, so it's going to be marked dative. So our verb use is going to be irrealis, dative. And the reason it's irrealis is because it's not actually happening. Um, it is just um, uh, sort of like what you what would be happening when you use it. And so that's why I'm marking it in realis. Um, now, maybe that's not what I want to do. This is an instinct I have from other languages that have a subjunctive, for example, that um, would mark it this way, or an infinitive that would mark it this way. My instinct is to mark this in realis because it's not happening. But we could mark it for a tense or something like... Um, I just, I'm having trouble thinking of what the tense would be if we were to mark it. Would it be it, um, an imperfective thing that happens over a period of time? Or um, a single perfective event that happened at a given point in time? I think it's easier to just mark it in realis, actually. Less, less work. Just say, it's hypothetical. You use it in order to row a boat if you were to do that, hypothetically. That's what in realis is meaning there. Um... But using it is the, or not use, what am I saying? Not used, row, row. <laughs> Rowing is what you would be doing with it, sorry. <laughs> and then boat is what you're rowing. Is it what you're rowing? In English, it's the object of row, but is it the patient of row? Is it what you row? You row a boat. Rowing is a specific kind of moving, and you are moving the boat. So I would say that boat is the patient of row. Yeah. So that is how that would go. So you, agent, use is our verb. It, which is a 
some crafted thing. So that's it. It in English just means some inanimate thing. Um, you use the inanimate thing in question. That's what it means here. Um, but we're saying the crafted thing because inanimate isn't really a kind of word we have. We, we're going more specific with it. What kind of inanimate thing? Well, it's an inanimate crafted thing. Someone constructed it. Man-made. So, and then what are you using it for? What's the goal of using it? So dative is marking the goal. Uh, you're using it to hypothetically, irrealis hypothetically, row a boat. Awesome. Now, what was that other sentence? Let me check the chat. Um, it was, I needed you a pizza and I ate it. But I ate it. Okay. Um, okay. So, my question here is, do I want to keep you keep needed as need n e e d, <laughs> or do I want to make it need with a k? Um, I think it would be more useful to see how need would work with a k here, uh, just because the roles with need, um, uh, are different than the roles with need. So you're an agent of kneading. You actively do it with your hands, whereas um, or with a rolling pin if you're using that, if you're one of those people. <laughs> um, or, <laughs> or I guess a bread maker. Um, they exist for a reason. Um, it does take effort and motor skills and stuff, and not everyone's able to do that, so a bread hook is valid. Um, but, um, uh, I think with need... K, you're the agent, whereas with need, N-E-E-D, you are the experiencer of that drive, right? You need it. You're not doing the needing. It's happening to you. Um, it's sort of like you are... It is... The thing is necessary for you. So you are sort of receiving that need abstractly. And that's why we're marking it with the dative here, as if it's being given to us. Because if you were to make this intransitive and to say, need pizza, then that would be pizza is necessary. And then by adding the first person dative, you're saying pizza is necessary for me. So that's why we're marking it dative. And that's just translating to I need pizza. All right, so what we're doing here is we're saying, um, let's put the English sentence. We're going to say, I needed oh i wanted to unbold these i don't know why these got all bolded i think i forgot to press b again there we go i needed you a pizza but i ate it okay i'm just gonna act like this um i'm just gonna put it into the syntax that would have the sentence uh, whether or not this is how it is in English, that doesn't matter. So, let's think about this when uh, Google Sheets gets with the program. Okay, I, um, the S is singular, first person singular, agent, I did the needing, so I needed for you. So the you here, the second person singular, is dative. It, you are the recipient of my having needed it. <laughs> I needed it for you. Um, technically, you're the beneficiary, not the recipient, but we've decided to just kind of merge those in this language with the dative case, as many Indo-European languages do. Um, actually, not just Indo-European languages. Lots of languages do this, actually. Um, I talked about why I probably usually won't need a beneficiary-recipient distinction, because the kind of verb will clarify it. This is not a verb of giving. This is a verb of action, so the dative person here um, I should probably specify that, it, no, no, with first and second persons, it's always human. So, um, yeah, second person, dative. Um, so I needed for you, and then pizza, pizza. Now, again, I will reiterate that it doesn't have to go in this order. I could put pizza first and put the second person dative after. I'm just putting it in the English order right now because A, it's allowed in this language, and B, it makes it easier to compare the two sentences um, for the sake of the people watching. So, pizza is unmarked. It's the patient. It's what the needing happens to. Um, and then we have but. However, 
And this but isn't an exception to pizza. It's an exception to need. And I have decided I don't want a whole separate one for that. Um, you know, there's kind of like a comma here. I could write a comma, since this is mostly going to be a written language with me taking notes on stuff. Um, I could put a comma there. Um, I could even have a verbal comma. I could have sort of some spoken punctuation here, um, if I wanted to. Or just require a pause. Uh, so it could be like, I need you a pizza, however, I ate it. But, um, the thing that will be... The thing that's interesting here is that I... The I in, um, need and the I in ate are the same role. They're both the agent. So in theory, I could... I could not repeat the agent. I could just say... Because it because I've made agent the topic, I could not repeat agent and just make it clear that I'm the agent of both. Uh, but eight, so it'll be eat unmarked because it's a past event. I don't have to mark it. And then the it again is the third person, and then it's also craft because pizza is something you have to make. Um, it's like something you have to process. It needs to be cooked. If it were a salad or something, it would probably not be craft. It would probably be the flora uh, gender because that it's just, you know, whatever greens you put in. Now, if there's processed things in the salad, then maybe we can call it craft. Um, but I think it depends on what kind of salad it is. Like if it's a pasta salad, then maybe it's craft. But if it's like, I don't know, a fruit salad, then the fruit in question would be flora. Now that... That's a choice I could make down the line. I could just say anything that you have to put together. If you have to, like, cut something and put it into a bowl, that counts as crafting it. Um, that could be fair. Um, but it depends on how... It depends on how I'm going to end up using this language. Because if I'm, if I'm describing what different cultures eat... Um, the reason I'm thinking about this is before I used to have a food gender, but I decided to split up food based on where the food comes from. Um... And the re my reasoning for that is if I'm describing where cultures get their food from, it's useful to have the food actually be the gender of the source of the food. Um, so, for example, if um, someone's eating meat, then whatever the word for the meat is would actually be in the animal gender that I had. Um, I've actually completed that with something, too. I'll talk about it when we get there, but... Um, Yes. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to the nails. It's not super important. The important thing is that the third person craft refers back to the pizza. Now, because the agent is the same as this agent, like the first person is doing the same thing in both senses. The need-er is also the eat-er, um, which is why I don't need to repeat it necessarily. I think that I, I'm allowing that. When something is the topic, you can skip it. If pizza were the topic, which it kind of feels like it is actually in the sentence, I would actually probably put pizza first and have the agent come after. Then I probably would then need to repeat. Um, actually, let me show you what that would look like. Because this is actually how the language is going to work, so I should probably give an example of that. Um, Alright, same sentence, different readout, because pizza seems more like the topic than I am. I is the subject, which is why I was putting it in that order. Now, if pizza is the subject, which it does, it um, when I say subject, I mean topic, really, because this language doesn't really have the subject in the same kind of way. Subject, in the sense that it's the thing that you can delete in more, if you add more, with conjunction. Um, okay, so we have um, pizza is the topic, really, so pizza's gonna come first. Need. And then I'm the agent of that. And then for you. Pizza, I needed for you. And then but, I aided it. Now the it would actually be the pronoun. It was eaten by me, so eat and then first person agent this time because the first person agent will come after eat. Now here, the third person craft will be optional because it's referring back to pizza. So pizza was needed by me for you, but 
was eaten by me. Um, is kind of how you do something like this in English. Because in English, we need to make a passive to have the patient be the subject most of the time. In this language, you don't actually need to change the syntax. You just, or you do change the syntax. You change the order, but you don't actually change anything about any of the words. You don't, there is no passive voice in this language. You don't need one. You just use the order, which is very concise. That's part of the goal. Now, the thing is, the thing I'm thinking is in this particular sentence, you can actually be even more compact. <laughs> um, because the agent is still the same between the two. It's still I who's eating it and needing it. And now we are also able to skip the third person <laughs> here. If, if the third person is the, the sort of topic that I'm able to skip, even it's even there's even more redundancy here because here the it is a patient so it's not the skippable thing but because the patient is the topic now i can skip it because it's the sort of thing that's coming before the verb so what it would be even more com compact actually is to do the other kind of coordination that i was talking about before with needed and folded because the patient is the same in both because I'm just using a pronoun for the patient, and the agent is the same in both. So, instead of saying, I needed, or pizza was needed by me for you, but it was eaten by me, uh, or even I needed you a pizza, but I ate it, like the first one, um, or I needed you a pizza, but ate it if you dropped the first person. Since third person craft, it kind of feels like I'm doing cross multiplication and then um, reducing the fractions or something, because uh, the third person refers back to pizza, and the agent refers back to the other agent, like it's the same agent. I could just put the but eat it after need, and just make it clear that everything is, that, that these are shared, that these, um, the I is sharing, or the I, the, the by me is shared by need and eat. Now the only issue here, oh great, <laughs> the page is slowing down. I cleared the cache, but it won't really like register that I did that until I like reload the page, which I will do pretty soon because I do need to take a short break to check in on the dog um, in just a few minutes once I finish talking about this stuff. So this could be very elegant. The issue with doing this is now both need and eat have so having the first person agent applying to both is fine however having the second person dative is not fine <laughs> necessarily because what this implies is if we were to do this in english we would be saying i needed and aided a pizza or yeah for you <laughs> so the, the issue you could probably hear that in the english once i said that is that you didn't eat it for them <laughs> It, it, in fact, it was kind of not, <laughs> they're not the beneficiary of your having eaten. Uh, I guess they, in an abstract way, are. They benefit from not, they, the benefit they get is not getting to eat it, <laughs> I suppose. But um, that's not great, <laughs> necessarily. Um, you're not eating it for them, <laughs> is I guess the issue, and that's why you wouldn't do this. Um, so I think maybe, I'm trying to think if there's a way to do this. If there's a way to have the second date of just apply to need, I needed for you, but, oh wait, yeah, pizza was needed for you, but eaten by me. The only issue now is you don't know, you're not saying explicitly who did the needing, um, which is why maybe you do just need to have this middle one here. You do just need to have, you do need to repeat the agent twice. Um, but it is still compact. I, it is still more compact in my opinion. It's actually the same compactness. You still need a pronoun in the second one. Um, you need one pronoun instead of two, but that's also possible in English. 
you could say but aided it um uh yeah so yeah there isn't a more compact way to do it than the english options i guess the most compact english option which is to get rid of the second topic if it's the same um without having some specialized coordinators um which i don't think i want i think i'm okay with this length it's not it's not going to be any longer at the very least than the english and potentially even less because i don't know that i'm going to have def indefinite articles at least now my page is very much not responding right now so that's a problem i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to reload the um i'm going to reload the um tab so that maybe it will register that i am um i have cleared the cache <laughs> Hopefully that does it. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> um, yeah, this is just taking forever. I might need to close my browser. The issue with closing the browser, however, is that I'm streaming the browser right now. I think I have a solution, though. Um, something real quick yeah <laughs> I think I do need to close the browser so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just do something else real quick which is I'll have a little thing <laughs> and I'll stop I'm gonna close the browser real quick um, restart it thanks for bearing with me <laughs> just while it's buffering okay it is once again streaming the tab <laughs> let's go to the, my twitch con line okay there we go Is it registering that I cleared the cache? That's my question, because I did clear the cache. But, um, yeah. Let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing the buffering thing now. <laughs> All right, so we're back. Let's see how long it takes to go to the agenda. Oh, it's still loading. I don't understand what's going on here. I've cleared the cache. Nothing's running on in the background that I can tell. So it's just, uh, yeah, the train is stucky wucky. Um, <laughs> it's just taking a bit to load, I guess. So um, I didn't really have anything else I wanted to, um, talk about with Order and Ambiguity? I think I might have, but I've forgotten since uh, what it was. Oh, why did it change the formatting all of a sudden? This should be the same. There's conditional formatting. That oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Uh, the other ambiguity thing I was going to talk about was um, there was another subordination thing, but we'll come back to that, I think, when we actually get into talking about the forms. And that's a discussion that we will have right after this break. <laughs> I need to go check on the dog now. Um, I will be gone for about, probably not even five, probably three minutes. Um, so I will be right back. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna write uh, 1833 
PST is when I'll be back. Um, okay, thank you. Alright, um, it is a couple minutes after <laughs> what I said it would be. It was more like five minutes, sorry. But I am back. Um, also, if you heard crunching, that is me eating, because I did not get a chance to have dinner before the stream, so that is that. Um, so the next order of business is to go back to adjectives. Um, because before, uh, we had talked about adjectives, and I was flipping back and forth on whether or not I wanted them to be nouns or verbs. Or noun-like or verb-like, I should say, instead. Um, but after talking about um, the way adjective clauses work, the way all of our subordinationists can work, I think at this point it's very safe to say that adjectives are basically verbs. <laughs> adjectives will be verb roots, as will most things, 
and you can easily derive nouns from them based on what class it is. So most adjectives are going to be, well, we have those different types of adjectives that we had listed, right? Based on um, that article from, uh, I am Dixon, <laughs> uh, Dix the Dixon article. We talked about uh, Dixon and um, Swadesh last time. Um, the adjective discourse. So, um, the different kinds of adjectives we had, uh, dimension, age, value, color, physical property, human propensity, etc. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so all of these, all adjectives are going to be verbs, basically, um, is what ultimately just became the obvious thing to do based on the way we're having adjective clauses work. Um, so we're just going to have them be verbs, definitively. They're not going to lean verb words. They're, they're going to be verbs, <laughs> basically. Adjectives are verbs. <laughs> um, but if you want to use an, a noun in a verb-like way, you or in an adjective-like way, you just turn the noun into a verb. And we're going to just make sure that you can very easily do that, which I think was already one of our goals. Easy derivation between parts of speech um, or features that we wanted to include to make things easier. Um, so yeah, that's just going to be the case. So adjectives equal verbs. <laughs> they're just verbs of quality. So dimension, age, value, color. Typically they're going to be stative. They're just going to describe what state the thing is in. So if you want to say the green the green hill, it's the hill which is green. Uh, and because it's the patient, what we've said in syntax is that if your relative clause is one in which the thing that is that clause is describing is the patient, you don't need a pronoun. So you basically just have a verb after your noun that is an adjective. <laughs> the verb is just to describe your verb. <laughs> um, so for example, we had like the woman, um, the, the woman, here we have the woman I saw. I saw describes the woman. So you're just going to have woman see, and then by me, like that's going to say that I saw her. She was seen by me. Um, the woman seen by me was that. That's basically what that means. Except in English, we say seen, which is a participle. In this language, you're just going to say the verbs see. Um, but because of the word order, it's going to be clear that it's describing woman and not. It's not the main verb. The main verb is sad because it's coming after the topic here. Um, uh, another example, like the pink woman. Um, if she's pink because she's blushing or whatever. Um, the woman who is pink. Like the woman who pink pinks. And it's clear that she's the patient of pink because there's no um, relative pronoun here. Here you see the three anim, and I'll explain why it says anim in a second, but the three anim, um, that's like the human gender here. Um, the woman, she, who sees me here. The woman who saw me. It's basically the woman um, I was seen by her. <laughs> the woman I was seen by her was sad. So... Um, and this example was actually given to us by chat last week, the one I saw was that, and I just worked with that last week. Um, really appreciating people in chat um, participating, because it's supposed to be a little bit interactive, even though it is my conline. Um, I like getting suggestions and stuff. So, um, uh, basically, because of the way that this ended up shaking out, we're basically just going to have adjectives be verbs. Um, so when we say adjective here, we're going to have nouns, possessives that we need if it's like my or your, etc. Those are going to come next. And then adjectives um, after that. And then the adjectives are basically verbs. So verb clauses. And if they have any objects or anything like that, then they come after the verb. So uh, that's adjectives done. So I could actually cross that off too. Um, I had put this down here because I wasn't sure at the time. But now there's not really a question. Adjectives or verbs in this language. We just treat them like verbs. Like to be tall, to be, I don't know, to be um, tired would just be a verb. And just to say the tired person, you say the person who tires, the person who is tired and is tired would just be a word. All right. Now to Clutchin. With to Clutchin. I wanted to return to the whole noun class thing because we used to have 10 noun classes. And what I have done is I have um, kind of squashed them a bit because I thought about what needs to be distinct grammatically 
and not all of these things need to be grammatically distinct um, with the goals that I have potentially. I'm, I think the thing I'm iffiest on this is this animate one. I might change my mind again and put it back to nine, but we will see. But the changes I made were, um, so we, before we had concept, phenomenon, matter, tools, food, locations, floral, fauna, human, supernatural. And what I have conflated is one thing, basically I split food and food is going to be split between what used to be tools is now craft and flora and fauna, depending on the source of the food. Because I thought it would be useful, instead of treating food like its own special thing, um, it would be useful to have foods marked for what their source is. So if it's just, if you're just eating an apple, apple is flor a floral noun. If you're eating fish, fish is an animal noun. Now I talked about how some languages have an actual lexical distinction between things, like um, they might have... English, for example, might have like, let's pretend this is the food row. <laughs> uh, they might have like beef versus cow. Um, and that is a useful distinction to have um, because that's something that we do as a culture. We distinguish between those two things. Like beef is, you know, the meat that comes from a cow and then a cow is an animal. Um, we don't do it with fish in English, but other languages do do it. For example, in Spanish, um, pes is fish but pescado is fish that you're going to eat. Like, this is a fish in the water, and this is a fish that you're about to eat. Um, so, languages will make these distinctions, but I have decided I would think, I would rather, I'm going to describe cultures, and the cultures themselves will make that distinction, but I would like to just describe things based on where they come from. Like, they're, they're sort of, what is the sort, what is like sort of the environmental origin of the food. So in order to talk about a food, I need to actually think about where the food comes from. And I think I like that. I like having my language grammatically specify where the food is coming from <laughs> as an inherent part of the language. I think that's that would be very useful um, if I'm describing foods. Um, I think it promotes like a kind of mindfulness about where foods are coming from too, which I value personally. Again, there are going to be some personal idiosyncratic to me choices here because it is my calling. Um, a calling other people are welcome to use, but um, that is a thing that I think I would value having. So I have kind of gotten rid of the food as its own class, and instead you're just going to mark the food for what it is. If it's completely processed, then it will be craft. So for example, bread is here. Now, wheat, its ingredient, would be floral, like its main ingredient, but there are other ingredients in it, and you're going to actually have to, it's going to go through a chemical process to become food. Um, I think it might get difficult for me to end up distinguishing these things, like I said with salad, for example, how much is that crafted and how much is that floral depends on the salad, I think. Um, like I said, a pasta salad, pasta you have to craft, but if it's just like lettuce and tomatoes and stuff, it's more floral. And so I think that can get a little murky. So I could have a situation where I allow things to change gender. Um, I'll talk about that when I get more into declension, which we're going to do very shortly. But um, I think I would like a situation where you can actually have two very similar words that have two different genders. So I could have salad, and depending on what I want to emphasize, if I want to treat it like it's a craft or if I want to treat it like it's the ingredients, I could make that decision because um, I would like these classes to be mostly productive, um, like mostly swappable, kind of like I want my parts of speech to be swappable. I want my noun classes to be swappable. And just a terminology thing, I, I've said this before, but I'm going to call this gender sometimes just because of the way many linguists will use the term gender to talk about this. Um, so it might sound funny when I say like geographic gender or like supernatural gender, but what I say gender, I mean noun class. It's a category of noun that will have sort of agreement based on it. Um, I'm not really doing agreement with my adjectives because my adjectives are verbs, but my pronouns will agree with the gender. So when I have third persons, oh, I forgot to re-merge these, whoops. When I have third person pronouns, the third person pronoun will refer back to the gender of the thing. Um, so the first conflation I did is I split food up into craft, floral, and animal, depending on where it comes from. The other conflation is this animal thing. Before, it had fauna gender, 
And then I had human gender. One moment. So I had uh, fauna, which were non-human animals, and then I had a human gender. And the reason I did that was because this is going to be used in social sciences a lot, and so I'm talking about people all the time. And I thought, you know, I'm talking about people. It will be useful to have people as their own class. But I thought of some example sentences, and I worked through them on my own outside of the stream because I wanted to get this figured out before today's session. Um, and I just thought that it it wasn't entirely necessary, really, to have two separate genders for humans versus all other animals. Um, because I'm talking about humanities and social sciences, humans are going to be the bulk of these nouns. I'll probably have plenty of animal nouns, too. But with the way my number system works, the main kind of justification that a lot of languages have or not justification, but like the main sort of pattern that you see in languages with, with noun classes is that the way that they treat number of animals ends up being different than the way they treat number of humans because humans tend to be count by default in most languages. You know, you have an individual and you like count them. Um, and then you can have groups. You have separate group nouns. Like person, it would be like persons versus people. Um, whereas with animals, you might have individual animals like a rooster or a dog, but you then have a lot of animal nouns where it's like a hive of bees would be a collective or like um, some of those fun um, nouns like a parliament of owls or something, you know, um, because animals, we tend to have more of them that Oh, cucumber shouldn't be here. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> cucumber is not an oh, Sea cucumber. That's what it was. Uh, the problem with sea cucumber was that it didn't fit in the row. So I was going to say um, sea urchin. I think that's what I was going to say. I, instead of, I, it said sea cucumber and I just got rid of the word sea, not really thinking about the fact that that made it a, a plant. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so usually, like, you have end up, you end up having more animals in, like, the fauna, usually it's like a zoological class or a fauna class, um, that are mass, uh, whereas humans tend to be, like, you know, individuals like Queen Hatshepsut or something, or I guess King Hatshepsut, um, would be an individual, but then you have certain mass nouns. But the way that my language is working, because I'm talking about sort of groups of people more generally, typically because I'm talking about history and anthropology, I'm still having like the collective as the default, mostly. So there isn't really as much of a grammatical reason to have it. Um, really, it would be the difference between... Uh, the way that this matters grammatically the most is with the pronouns. So like my third person pronoun, before I had it, human versus fauna. And so human was like, it could be like she or they or he or something like that in the singulative. And then they more like all of them collective in the in the collective um and then the the animal one would basically be the same except they're not human <laughs> like the um fauna um but then i thought there's already murkiness in a lot of human languages <laughs> about whether or not you use if there's an animate inanimate distinction whether to use animate or inanimate for animals um we kind of in english we tend to kind of jump back and forth depending on how close we are with the animal we might say the rooster um crowed or like cock did crow i'm having trouble worrying what a rooster does um, a rooster um the rooster woke everyone up because it was loud i said it um i could have said he we actually do know the sex of the rooster because rooster tends to be refer to males and then like hen would refer to female um but i i didn't say he i said it because in english i have the option to mark that as inanimate um whereas if if i'm talking about someone's dog for example i might be more more inclined to use a gendered pronoun that implies animacy in english because it's like considered a family member or something like that um other sort of domesticated animals like horses for example might get 
more animate pronouns like she or he or something. Um, but it's kind of wishy-washy. And I think one option I could do is having human gender and just having certain animals be able to refer to as human pronouns, kind of like we do in English. Um, but I feel like it's not that useful of a distinction because it's going to be clear in context what the animate noun is referring back to. So I'm just calling it animate for now, and that could be humans or other animals. So basically, animate is animal, but especially humans because of the purpose of this language is mostly going to refer to humans. Um, and a lot of languages just group all animate things into animate. It's just where they cross, draw the line with animate that gets different. But here I'm going very minute with the other things that are not in the animate class. Now, the other thing is that some plants are what we might consider animate in the English sense, but we still would refer to them with inanimate pronouns grammatically. So for example, if you have like a Venus flytrap or something, you're still going to call it it usually in English, because it's inanimate. Um, um, but, okay, someone's signing off chat, but goodbye. Thank you. Um, so, um, where the line is drawn with animate versus inanimate, it's very language specific. Um, but I think it's less ambiguous here in this language because I have such a clear delineation of what is not in the animate class. Like if it's, a, if it's in this floral class, like plants, fungi, bacteria, viruses, then it's not animate. If it's a geo, if it's the location, it's not animate. If it's a craft thing, it's not animate. Um, we can always think of edge cases, and I think I'm just going to allow those edge cases to be changeable depending on the situation. But I don't think there's a good grammatical reason to have to have them be separate. Um, if I can think of one later, I might go back and have a human gender. But for now, um, I decided to merge humans with all animals. Just if it's an animal, including humans, it will be treated the same grammatically. So that is um, that first issue with noun declension. Um, so here's the declension table I made way back when. And um, I edited it to reflect the new genders. So we've got the eight genders. Uh, concept, phenomenon, matter, craft, geographic, um, floral, animate, and supernatural. And what I have also are columns for collective and singulative of each one for the different forms. Now, what I said before, what we've been saying when we were talking about the typology of the language, for example, um, was that we want something that's mostly concatenative and nonlinear, flexive in that things will change um, or have different variants of each other depending on class. Mostly it's going to be noun class. Um, cumulative in that things are all bunched up in one affix rather than separated out um, into multiple morphemes for the most part. And synthetic mostly and that you're mostly affixing things onto other words rather than having them be analytic. Um, like just lots of spaces, like less less isolation, or more isolation for analytic, less so for synthetic. Um, but this is the word level, whereas this is like the morpheme level. So if we're applying these sort of general preferences for this language onto nouns, what we're probably going to do is have um, for each case, have a collective and a singulative version of each case ending, or of each case marker. Um, and it's going to be different. Um, so like the collective concept patient um, is going to have a thing that marks it as collective concept, which is unmarked. It's just marked for its gender, but nothing else. Because patientive is unmarked and collective is unmarked. And similarly with the phenomenon, where this is just going to mark phenomena, whereas agentive is going to have some extra stuff on it, as will all the others. 
Now, when I'm thinking about this, I thought a little bit more about the relative compactness of having it actually not be entirely cumulative. Um, because I thought about how many different forms I have to have, right? If every single one of these is entirely unique, nothing like linking them, we have eight genders times two numbers, which is 30, oh no, I was, I was adding another thing, but which is 16 um, patientives. So we have 16 different forms, and then we have to multiply that by seven. <laughs> So 16 times 7 unique forms. If they're all entirely unique, um, we need 16 times 7 unique markings. Uh, whatever 16 times 7 is, that's um, 112 here. Yeah, there probably is just a way for me to highlight, the <laughs> highlight these and it tell me how many cells I'm highlighting, but um, I don't know how to do that on Google Sheets, so I'm just going to... Yeah, I just did the math with a calculator. <laughs> I, I didn't do the math, the calculator did. Um, 112, I think that's I think that's correct. 16 times 7, that sounds right. Um, yeah, 112 is a lot of unique markings. So I'm less married to this whole cumulative thing. Um, and another reason I'm not completely married to it, and I'm more like iffy on it, the, the whole idea of it being cumulative is it saves space, and compactness is one of my goals. But I can still have things that save space without my declensions being entirely cumulative. I could still have them be separative, but short. Um, and what I'm thinking is I can do this with having maybe vowels associated with like maybe vowels or vowel combos or vowels in a consonant associated with the gender the class and consonants associated with everything but the patient here so basically i need like six consonants that will be associated with the cases and then we still are in the same syllable we're not adding syllables um, necessarily. Um, so it's still pretty compact, it's just predictable. So there's like, so it is technically agglutinative in that sense. We are sort of stacking endings, but this, the stacking is like, this vowel means the class and this consonant means the case. Unless it's patient in which there's no consonant. Um, so I cooked up some ideas for how that might look and how many if I just use vowels, I would need eight vowels in this language if I, they all needed to be unique. Um, I could have diphthongs, multiple vowels in a row, um, like two vowels in a row for some of these. That would cut down the number I need. Um, for example, if I had, um, let me see. If I had three vowels, but I allowed every diphthong combination of those, I could have nine combinations of those, which is more than I technically need. Um, but I could have some that are just a vowel and some that are diphthong, in which case I don't even need that many. I could have, mm, I think I still need three vowels, because if I do, let's see, let's pretend I had two vowels in this language in the event that I had two vowels. I could have, okay, let's say I had Let's say I had three vowels. Let's start with there. Let's say my three vowels are like the most common three vowel system. E, A, U, right? I could have maybe E, A, U. I'm just randomly assigning these. Um, I, A, U, U, E. Um, and I still have E and A, and I didn't even use U, because I could have nine, potentially. So if I hypothetically decided to have, like, humans again, like a separate human versus fauna, 
if I wanted to, I could just, you know, have Ool be that or something. Again, it, it, would, it could be switched up, but, like, I would have enough for nine just with three vowels. If I had two vowels, it would be different. I'd be like, I would have E, A. Uh, like, let's say my vowels are E and A. Uh. I would have, like, E, A, uh, I, Ya. Yeah. And that's only, like, four options, right? <laughs> Unless I had, like, two of the same. Which, when it's like, it would kind of be like having a long vowel, so it'd be like E and A, ah, that bring me to six. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I want that. Um, so, in theory, having fewer vowels works. If I do four vowels, for example, I would, I could have like E, A, 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 O, or E, A, O, maybe. Um, no, O, or something. I could like merge O and O, something a lot of languages do. Um, then I could have plenty. I could have like a, ah, I could have a, I could have e, <laughs> I could have u, and then I could have, you know, i, I could have a, I could have o, and I could have u. Maybe if I didn't, if I, and if I did that, I wouldn't even need to allow like high, high plus non-high vowels with each other. It's just low to high which I tend to like those kind of diphthongs better. It just depends on the language, and sometimes I like high to low. But I, A, O, A, O, something like that. You know, I could do that. Um, with four, I would have just enough for that. Um, oh, well, I mean, I could have more. I could have, like, ui, ua, ue. I could have ia, ie, iu. Like, you know, I could have different ones um, in different circumstances. So it just depends. So I could make vowels work if I wanted diphthongs. I don't love the sound of having diphthongs necessarily differentiate my genders from each other because I like the idea of having a diphthong be one of the cases potentially or being how I indicate like the singulative versus the collective. Um, so I would prefer it if there were something where I could have um, uh, uh, just one vowel associated with the gender, but I also don't want eight vowels. <laughs> so, I actually played with a lot of different possibilities. Like I made a little, a bunch of little toy languages where I tried this out, and um. Essentially, what I did was um, I looked at like what it would look like to have them be prefixes, what they would look like to be suffixes, if they were just little particles that said the case and the gender separated from the root. I thought about what that would look like and how that might work. And I think the one that I liked the most, even though it was, it was one I was trying to just resist going with because of convenience. It's what I tend to do. I tend to have things be suffixes. Lately, I've been doing a lot of, like, um, particles in a lot of my languages, because I've been going very minimalist with a lot of my languages recently. But, um, after playing with a bunch of toy languages, I think I like suffixes the best for this kind of agreement. So what I thought about was I was thinking of having two sets of vowels um, and kind of splitting the genders down the middle. If I keep this sort of eight gender system, splitting the genders down the middle and saying that like um, these genders, these four here, like four and lower, like craft and down would be given like one set of vowels and then geography and above um would be given another set of vowels um like a pair and i was thinking maybe like maybe a o for these ones and what i mean with the pairs of vowels is that collective would be a and singulative would be o and then here doing a similar thing but having e and u um for the ones up here, and these would kind of be like 
environmental noun, so like place, flora, fauna, humans, supernatural. And then these down here would be sort of a super class of like crafts, materials, and abstracts, like phenomena and concepts and stuff. Um, so like physical and abstract things versus your sort of environment and thing, living things in it. Um, that was sort of like the rough distinction I came up with. So for example, concepts could be like a in the collective and o in the simulative, or they, it could be flipped. And then cases, um, if these were suffixes, which I was thinking I prefer, um, could be like a and o. And then the cases would be consonant endings. And I came up with a bunch of different ones. I have, I have ideas for what I would want them to be. If I were making this language a priori, I would just go ahead and do that, but we haven't decided upon that yet. Um, so that was my rough concept if that were to be the case. Again, I don't know if my language is going to be a priori or a posterior, but I would prefer whatever route I go to have suffixes. So I'm going to write this somewhere at the bottom, maybe. I would prefer, actually, I'll just write this on the noun sheet, probably, because um, this will just be my reference for the declension. I would prefer suffixes. Oh, and the thing I didn't say, the thing I was working up to, is like, say concepts are just pure A and O um, as suffixes, right? Um, and then you add consonants to those to make them different cases. Um, phenomena could be a consonant followed by A. So maybe it's le, lo. So what the only thing I would need to think about is depending on the shape of my roots, they would need to be consonants that would be allowable to like, let's say the root ends with a consonant, they need to be like a legal cluster. Like if it ends with a K, if like my root ends with a K and I want to make a phenomenon out of it, I would need to be able to say like, cl, like that would need to be allowed with my font of tactics. Um, so I would need to think about that. So I would need to choose um, consonants that I could go maybe like me, no, maybe like me, mo, for example. And then up here, it would just, the, the vowels would change. So I could have like e, maybe supernatural with e, or maybe, maybe animal with e. So it would be like e, u. I could have like li, lu. I could have ni, no. And I could have ni, mo. You know, it would just depend on what I wanted to do and what was allowed with my like sound system. And I'm also, again, not married to this ordering. This ordering is just the order I came up with them in, and I had a vague sort of sense of animacy with these. Um, uh, like an animacy sort of like rise of like lowest animacy, like concepts, abstracts to like more concrete things to living things to supernatural things that have control over human things, etc. Um, that was sort of the way I was ranking these, but if it becomes better for the morphology to rank them differently, the ranking doesn't have to mean anything. I'll come back to that later. I'll like think about that some more. But the order is just arbitrary for now. <laughs> it's just the order I put them in. Um, like let's say I want to put the L ones together and the N ones together, for example. But this is all hypothetical. I haven't really decided if this is even a thing I'm allowed to do yet. But that's the kind of thing I would prefer, is just like the consonant class is indicated by either a consonant or lack thereof plus the vowel. Um, and I can get away with like having a very small vowel inventory of like maybe four or three if I'm okay with diphthongs. Um, I can maybe get away with three just if I break it down into three groups rather than four and do diphthongs for the singulative if the diphthongs are allowed. So let's say, let's say I had three. Um, I think three would be easier to break down if I had nine <laughs> genders again. I might go back to human. We'll think about, I'll think about that some more. I'm going to do some more examples with it. I couldn't find a reason to have separate humans and animals, but it might, it might come up. I might do more examples um, in, with topics that are in the language. So let's see. Let's say I had three vowels. Let's say I had E. Let's say E was for the more inanimate things, right? Um, let's cut that off at matter. Um, e. Let's say. Um, let's say. I have craft be like you know 
BA, geographic BA, floral BA, and then I have like animals BU and humans. If I had a separate human, that would be U, and then supernatural be U, right? Um, and then I differentiate these. Maybe concepts is just E, maybe phenomena is just L, and then maybe matter is just M. Then maybe craft is just A, then geography is just L, and flower is just M. And then maybe animal is just U, and then supernatural is U. Again, with those just simple like liquid consonants and nasal consonants there. Um, and then if I if I did diphthongs, I could have the plural be like you, maybe you, or ia, yeah, kind of like ia yeah, better, ia, yeah. um, you know, lia, mia, and then add consonants to these, um, you know, ai, lai, Uh, my, uh, I could do like maybe ua or ui, ui, and lui, or I could do ua and lua. Um, I could also switch the a here. I could say a, e, and i. I kind of like rising, or not rising, but that is a rising song, um, just because of how I'm pronouncing it, but the low to high is what I mean. Uh, low vowel to high vowel, a to e, um, lai, and my. And then ow and lao. I kind of like that, how that sounds better personally. Um, it would just, I need to come up with something to do with ah, la, ma. Um, maybe, maybe something, maybe I choose a consonant to come before, maybe, or not a consonant, but um, a, a different vowel to intervene, like u or e or something. If I had three vowels, that is. Um, now, I did talk about the possibility of merging the numbers in some of the classes, either in the declension or in the pronouns. And I thought about that some more because they said I would between sessions. And as it turns out, I don't think it's a good idea for any of them because I think it will be useful in some contexts to be able to make things individuated. If for nothing else than the fact that the singulative or the count, at least for some of these more cla like mass ones, the ones that will be mostly be mass nouns, but will occasionally be count. Um, if count is how I'm doing partitives, then I would like to have count, even for, even for the more massy ones. For example, um, especially phenomena, if they're natural phenomena, I would like to count those, like tornado as a concept versus multiple tornadoes, or a single tornado. I would like to differentiate those. Because if these were merged, a single tornado and the concept of a tornado, all tornadoes in existence would be the same word. And I thought about the ways I could differentiate that. You know, I could specify, I could have a number to say like one tornado versus many tornado without it being singulative. But um, then there came to be other things because especially the phenomenon noun class encompasses so many things. Um, there are some things that I would like to count in this. Um, uh, illnesses, for example, like if you have, for example, someone who has an illness, their condition is a phenomenon. The, the thing that causes the illness, if it's a virus, for example, it would be flora. Um, but um, the condition itself is a phenomenon. And I would like to differentiate between, say, the condition and, you know, cases of that condition, which would be singulative. Um, even the concepts, like a lot of concepts will just be like nounified versions of verbs. So like the concept of running. I could use the singulative for like iterations of running, like how many times did you run? Like, I went on five runs. Um, that could be singulative. Now, I could, you know, because I gave a number there, I could have that be collective. However, I thought it through, and I'm not going to do that. Um, so, I am not going to merge any of these numbers. So I do need to think through a way to do that. Because I was thinking if I do the diphthong thing, the ones where I merge the numbers could just be ah ah, um, or I could have length. I'm actually, if I have low to high diphthongs, I'm more okay with just having long ah and nothing else, or long e. But that's a phonology question for later. But it is something to keep in mind with my phonology, knowing that that's something I would want to be able to do potentially.
I think the best option, though, is maybe to have four vowels. Um, and not have diphthongs for the singulative as much as I might like that. Um, I think... I think that might be better to just have a unique vowel. So like the A, O, I think O, A actually sounds better. There's something about the font aesthetic of close, closer vowels or fronter vowels feeling more individuated. It's, it's a sound um, symbolism thing that I'm experiencing. It might be a Kiki Boba thing, maybe Kiki being sharper and smaller and then Boba being bigger and rounder. Uh, e and O, <laughs> A and O, Kiki Boba. Um, I think O is more Bulba, and I'm okay with Bulba being collective masses, and then Geeky being individuated, counted, single things. Um, I think that's the sound symbolism that's going on in my brain. So I, that's something to think about and keep in mind when I get to my phonology. So I'm going to look at my agenda and mark that. So uh, when I say vowels, let's, let's think about keep in mind... Um, um, noun classes, and I want to think about a o or o a versus I want to say like collective versus singulative o a versus o e with the keyboard in mind, and also like having that be the thing, and then with consonants, um, or I guess phonotactics, I want to say like have think about. Keep in mind, um, um, word class suffixes between root and, um, cases. Nice. Okay. And then also have, allow some final, at least I need at least six legal coda consonants. And we'll explain what that is when we get to phonotactics later. If you're not sure what that is, um, or have any questions about that, that will all be explained when I get to phonotactics. But we are still up here in declension. So, um, but I think that's that's it for me to say on declension. There's no cases I think I can merge, at least with most nouns. Um, I thought about it with pronouns. Um, I'm actually pretty iffy on merging any with the pronouns even except maybe vialis and commutative. I'm, I'm not sure. I need to think about it a little bit more. But I'm leaning towards no, at least with first and second person. I, I think I want all the cases for first and second person. Third person, I'm still leaning no, but I, I can think about that some more. Um, so that is that there. Um, so that's declension. Um, just I wanted to talk about my thoughts on the merged classes and the... Um, ideas I had for differentiating the classes grammatically. So I'm leaning towards suffixes, um, and I think I'll write this in nouns too, just ideas, um, suffixes. Um, so it's going to go like root, gender, case. Or remember, it's called class. Root, class, case. I'll merge these cells just so it's not squished. So that's sort of the order it goes in. So there's root, and then there's class, and then there's case. And this dot that I'm using, that's that's me marking that there's like a derivational uh, marker. This isn't like the standard. This is just a thing that some people do in their grammars, is they'll put a dot between derivational morphemes. This, this would derive from the root a noun of that class. And then the case is an inflectional ending, which is a marking with a dash. That's showing that it's a case ending that I could remove um, without changing the meaning of the word. It would just change the role in the sentence. Um, so that that's my thoughts on declension. Okay, now the final thing to talk about in our last few minutes of this session are verbs. So I thought good, long, and hard about verbs. And there are some things I noticed about verbs um, and the way that I was breaking up tense, aspect, mood, etc. Um, that I wanted to revisit. Um, because um, I thought of some examples and was working with them when I was thinking about those other things with the nouns. Um, and also having talked about the way that adjectives are going to work and relative clauses and all of that, um, I wanted to think some more about um, what 
what the benefit and deficits, the pros and cons of having this system are. So I don't want to touch the, um, the evidentiality. I, I relabeled it for like a more standard thing. Direct, indirect is how it's labeled in <clears throat> languages with that system. I know mine works a little bit differently than those languages, but it works slightly differently in every language. So the fact that it works differently in my language isn't a reason that I can't use these labels. Um, that's sort of my justification there for using direct, indirect there. Um, so um, I'm still get a little iffy on this being the default, but that's where, that's how I feel right now. When I, if I do more examples and find that imperfective is coming up way more, then I will change that to be imperfect. I might be leaning towards that. Um, however, um, one thing that I was thinking about is this whole non-pass-pass -pass thing. So the perfective and imperfective difference, just to review quickly, is perfective is something that happens at one point in time, or that is seen as a whole event in and of itself. Um, and in my language, it's only really being marked in the past. Something that's seen as like an entire event that occurred, or a state that was held for a short amount of time. Um, an example of a state that can be perfective is like, for example, anger. Like, I got angry would be perfective. Um, because it, you're seeing that as an event, like, that happened, that, you know, being angry, being the state of being angry, that would be a state. However, it's not an ongoing sort of habitual or progressive one. Um, progressive in the sense that it is currently happening while something else is happening. It could be, in which case it would be imperfected. But, um, unless you're saying that I was a generally angry person... <laughs> Uh, which would be imperfect, it would be sort of more ge general, long, ongoing, or frequent, habitual action. That would be imperfect. Um, that would be like, they were an angry person would be like imperfect. And then perfective would be more like, they were angry in that moment kind of thing. Some languages use emotions and have them be imperfect regardless of how long they lasted. And they only mark it perfect if it's like the them becoming that emotion is imperfect or is perfective but everything else is imperfective um so like he got angry would be perfected but he was angry even if it was for like an, a time that is seen as complete like an hour for example or even like two minutes <laughs> um it would still be imperfective because it was a state that they were in so this is that's still a choice i could make um but in general if i'm describing events in the past I'm probably going to be using perfective more. But I'm also describing languages and cultures a lot, and those things tend to be more habitual, custom, frequent. So I might go to having imperfect be first, in which case I'd probably just put this on top too, because I like that mark one coming on top. Um, so that is, um, that's that. I need to do more examples before I decide on that. But the other thing that I thought about is the whole pass, non pass thing, um, and how much I need them. Because I thought about how, you know, I'm going to be talking about the past a lot. I'm talking about history. So making sure that I'm distinguishing between when something is currently happening versus it happened in the past, you know, that seems important. Um, like it was this way, imperfective, but now it's this way, non-past. Whether it's perfective or imperfective is not super relevant. We talked about why way back in one of the earlier sessions um, when we talked about verbs the first time. So That was why we had the non-past. But I did some more examples, like I said, um, played around. Um, I, I don't have the documents of the thing, the playing around I did, because I didn't do it on this document or anything. I mostly did it on like paper and in a notes app on my phone. Um, uh, so that's not easy to share. But um, I will give some examples when I made decisions on some of these things I'm still thinking about, but um, thinking about it more, most of the things that would be non-pass that I'd be using it for would be describing languages that currently exist or cultures that currently exist as they are in general. So mostly it's going to be imperfective, but um, it's kind of more like a gnomic aspect. Like this is how it is 
in general, irrespective of the time. Like, that's kind of the idea. Like, if I say something like, if I describe a linguistic feature, like, let's say, adjectives describe nouns, like the state of nouns, um, in languages that have them. That, I mean, I'm using the present tense, but that's kind of a gnomic aspect. Um, like, I'm just describing how things are. Or if I say something like, 2 plus 2 is 4. <laughs> That's gnomic. I use the present, but it's gnomic because it's just like a general truth. And a lot of the time if I'm describing language, it works like that. However, um, so I thought, you know, I could just use my non-pass and it really usually has a gnomic function or just a non-unmarked thing, which would be a reason to use have non-pass be unmarked, actually, like it is in English, for example. However, um, the thing about culture is that it's always changing. And the thing about history is that it's always happening. And even things like 2 plus 2 is 4, which this language isn't super intended to focus on the fact that that's gnomic, but just, you know, if numbers come up, they're going to come up, but um, they're not the focus. The math itself is not really the focus. Um, using a non-past is a gnomic feels kind of, like, strange, um, even though that's the main use that the non pass would have in this language. Unless people are using it to actually communicate with each other, um, in the event that people want to use it, um, people other than me, which some people expressed in the questions that I got a few sessions ago. But, um, The thing I came to is that there are some things I would want to differentiate in the non-past between perfective and perfective. And I thought maybe I should just have a perfective and perfective slash gnomic and have the imperfective be slash gnomic. Um, things that are happening in the moment, like right now, that are going to be done in a second, or like seen as a whole, like I'm eating pizza, and that would be imperfective technically, because progressive is imperfective. But I could say like... Um, I'm crushing the, I mean, I'm using a progressive, which tends to be seen as imperfect, but I'm seeing it as an entire event, which is why it would probably be, be, be considered perfective in this language, at least, um, versus like, I speak, um, if someone were to say like, I speak Thai, that's imperfect if it's like a general thing, it's true for them. It's habitual present. Um, now, the thing I came to is essentially that the perfective and perfective distinction was more important in this language than the past non past distinction. But didn't I just say that this language is going to be talking about history and anthropology a lot and knowing if it's currently happening versus if it's not happening? now, but happening in the past important? Yes, it is important. In fact, time in a language dedicated to history and the humanities feels so important to me that I feel like I want an entire system of very clearly delineating or expressing what time something is happening in that I don't think I even want marked on the verbs. Um, so what I mean is, Rather than having past and non-past and just having perfective and perfective in the past, perfective and imperfective is going to matter regardless. Like, it, it's what matters. But I'm not using my verbs to mark past tense versus present tense. Instead, I am going to have a very robust system for expressing time. Um, I'm going to think about different models for that because I'm going to be writing about history a lot. So I want to think about different models I can use to have a time system that is actually, like, useful for this language um, to express in a very compact way very specific notions of time, much more so than a non-past-past distinction. Like, um, the reason I went so simple with past-non-past -past is because a lot of the other kinds of tense distinctions in natural languages um, 
tend to be relative ones, like future in the past or present retrospective or all that kind of stuff, past, present, future, distant, past, or recent past. What distant or recent mean in a language that's built on history needs to be way more specific than just recent versus non-recent. So I'm going to come back and do like a whole system of maybe particles or something that tell you what time specifically something is occurring. In. And my verbs are actually going to get to simplify down to perfective and imperfective. Is it an ongoing thing? Which I'm going to include nomic in imperfective. It's like, is it a general truth? And then perfective is just events taken as a whole. You're seeing them as an action that's completed or a state that happened momentarily or something. Um, and that makes me, that gives me fewer verb distinctions I have to have because I'm going to have a whole system for time. Um, so this is just how ongoing or is kind of how I'm boxing the events. Is it something that happens over a period of time or in general? Or is it something that is discrete um, that I'm seeing is like done? Which maybe imperfective and perfective is not the right word. I would need to check. It might be telicity that I'm referring to, but I'm not entirely sure how accurate that is. I need to think a little bit more about how I'm going to use these before I relabel them. Um, so that's another thing I'm going to do between now and then. So. Um, that is my verbs, um, my verb conjugation decision for now. Um, and I think having the imperfective, just be imperfective and not care about tense. Um, the thing that was I was coming to with that was describing, like using adjectives. Because adjectives are verbs, usually they're going to be things that are ongoing. They're like states, so most of the time they're going to be imperfective. Um, but if I'm describing a language now like that's like currently around, I would want to differentiate between like a feature it currently has, like or something that's currently true about a culture versus something that's ongoing about a culture. Um, something that's like happening versus something that's generally true. And my adjectives can't do that if they're just marking themselves for non-past and not. Yeah, most adjectives are going to be imperfective anyway, and marking them for non-past just feels weird. So if my adjectives are just imperfective, then the imperfective almost acts like an adjective ending in those relative clauses. It's just like, yeah, it's an imperfective adjective. And if it's perfective, that's more like a, you became that adjective, like an inchoative kind of thing. Um, we can talk more about that. And that's also another thing. The adjectives are another thing that's kind of pushing me more towards having imperfective maybe be the general, um, or like the, not the general, but the, um, the unmarked one. But I will think about that some more, do some more a little toy language stuff with that. But yeah, that's the verbs. And so that's the last thing we're going to have time to talk about today. We're five minutes over almost. So what I'm going to do now, not BRB, we're going to go to um, agenda. So we got through declension and conjugation. Next time, we're going to talk about discourse. Um, we're going to get into pragmatics. We're going to talk about discourse. And um, I'm going to give a little outline of like some of the things I tend to think about when I conline, because part of the whole point of the series is to give an insight into how I conline, um, things I tend to think about in discourse. Now, this language, because of its goal, is going to be a lot of this discourse stuff might not even apply or be that important. Or a lot of the things that tend to be important will not be as important in this language. I tend, to, I like to think a lot about the discourse in my conlines, especially recently. But for this one, it might look a little different and a little odd compared to the way I do it in other languages. Um, so we're going to talk about discourse next time, and if that doesn't take the whole time, then we will maybe talk about, finally, trying to decide whether or not I want this language to be a priori or a posteriori. That's what this sourcing means. But since this is the end of the session, I also want to like put in what like my review is going to be for next time. And in my review, I would like to put what my like to-dos are between now and then, the things I want to think about between now and Saturday. So what did I say I was going to test some more? I said that I was, um, let's see, um, I said that I was going to t think about imperfective, um, perfective some more, like which one should be default. I was going to think some more about, what's the other thing? Just kind of slide around here. 
about verbs to clench in. Um, it was mostly the verbs that I was going to test out stuff with. Um, I just know there was something with nouns that I was going to think about more, too. Um, this root glass case thing. Um, I liked that. I think it, I think I can't really do anything until we decide with that, until we decide where this language is coming from. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's mostly the imperfect perfect thing. I'm going to do more tests. Design unmarked, unmarked. Okay, so um, to end this stream, I'm just going to give some announcements for the next ones. Um, so um, tomorrow from 5.30 um, p.m. Pacific to 8 p.m. Pacific, we have Yester Lore. And um, last week we were doing riddles, um, Anglo-Saxon riddles. Tomorrow we'll be, we'll be doing maybe one or two more riddles. Um, and I'll try to pick easier ones this time. And then we're going to look at some other stuff that is yet to be announced um, because it's going to be pretty interesting um, what I have in mind. It just kind of depends on the time and how long the, things, the other things we do take. Um, and then the next con line with me where we're going to get back into um, discourse, um, I will tell you what I've thought about with the imperfective perfective thing. Then we'll get into discourse. Um, and then if that doesn't take the whole time, we'll get into source. Where is this language going to come from? Is it going to be a priori or a posteriori? And we'll go over what that means again. And that will be from 3.30 um, p.m. Pacific to 7 p.m. Pacific. That might change between now and then, but um, if if it does change, it will be updated on my schedule as soon as possible. Um, but that is going to end my stream for today. Thank you, everyone who showed up today. Um, thank you, all the people in the future who may be watching the recordings of this. These will be on YouTube pretty soon, like pretty, pretty soon. Um, so um, look out for that. Um, once those are up, then I will put the link to YouTube on Twitch. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, night, morning, afternoon, whatever time it is. And thank you for being here. And thank you for crawling with me. Goodbye. <laughs>